right, so Ezra chapter 7. Uh, this chapter is going to be broken up into two different sections, so I'll be teaching again next week. Uh, so I'm going to start off with just kind of a, an introduction, not so much to the book, but just to kind of catch us up to where we have gone through already um, in the first six chapters of Ezra. Well, first, Ezra uh, is, is a scribe, and he is ascribed as being the author of this book of Ezra. And most likely, he was also the author of the book of Chronicles and most likely the book of Nehemiah. Um, so that's something that I was um, noticed, that he's uh, not just the book author of Ezra, but of, of these other books as well. So it would be First and Second Chronicles. Uh, uh, the Jewish people at this point uh, had been exiled to Babylon in three different stages. Um, the one that we're reading about most recently is in 586, where the Babylonians have taken Judah captive, and this is the third deportation of the Jews to Babylon. But they were exiled to Babylon in three stages, and we're going to notice that they start returning to Judah in three stages at the permission of the Persians. So 586, the Babylonians take Judah, they destroy the temple, in 539, I know there's quite a few dates here. I probably should have put it on a slide and put it up there so you could look at it while I was talking. But just kind of keep a, like a mind's eye uh, chronological timeline from the left going to the right, the left being back in time, coming to the right, forward in time. So 586, uh, Judah and the temple destroyed. Come on down to 539 B.C. Uh, Cyrus begins to reign in Persia. And he conquers Babylon and is now the, the, the reigning person there in Persia. We read a little bit about him in earlier chapters of Ezra. And then in 538 uh, B.C., um, Ezra chapter 1, the return of the Jews to Judea uh, begins with Zerubbabel uh, leading the first group, and they start to rebuild the temple. Then all the way down to 536, the Temple construction actually begins in 536, even though they returned in 538. So it took a little bit of time there before they got the construction underway. And then finally, from 536 down to 515 B.C., now this is where the temple, the second temple, is being rededicated uh, at this point. It's the, the construction has been completed at 515 B.C. So Ezra's, Ezra chapters 1 through 6 have taken place. By the time now we get into Ezra chapter 7, obviously, uh, the second temple was eventually remodeled by Herod uh, and then destroyed in 70 A.D. by the Romans. So if you want to get an idea of what the first temple looked like, this is Solomon's temple. Uh, if you go online and look at some pictures, there's a lot of different graphic representations, uh, but this one was kind of nice. It, it kind of showed what was outside the temple as far as the, 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 the lavers or lavers and, and the bases and the molten sea and the the, what they call the inner court, and then the, the, um, the pillars uh, outside on either side of the entry of the porch area. And then uh, if you have really good eyesight, you might be able to notice the numbers inside the, the, the holy place and the holy of holies. And the little um, over here on the left, you can see the one through eight numbers representing all the different things that are inside of the temple as well. So this is the first temple, Solomon's temple. And then the temple that we see now, uh, again, destroyed in 586 B.C. Now the second temple, which is probably more a depiction of what it looked like after Herod got done with it. Um, the second temple, Zerubbabel's temple, uh, probably wasn't this ornate and glamorous. Uh, but notice there's quite a few construction differences. Like back on the Solomon's temple, you see the the wings on the left side and on the right side and around the back that were really attached to the walls of Solomon's temple, whereas you don't see that on the second temple. Uh, you just have the, the outer walls that are separated, not really attached to the temple. So there were some physical differences that are described in Scripture between the two temples. And then the third temple uh, is talked about in Scripture and other books of the Bible that we won't be going into, and, and so it's, a, it's still yet to be built. Um, so that's going to be happening sometime in the future. Uh, a lot of, uh, from the stage, I know Pastor Kevin or Pastor David, um, I don't know if Pastor Nick has mentioned uh, on, on different occasions, you know, that 
there's a temple institute that has actually started to rebuild some of the implements uh, that would go inside of the temple uh, once it is rebuilt. Um, so that's a, and there's a websites where you can go see all that stuff that's already completed uh, now and just ready for that third temple to be built. So 515, the second temple, this one, uh, was uh, completed and dedicated. And then skipping ahead a ways to 458 BC on this timeline. Now this is when uh, Artaxerxes, King Artaxerxes, uh, reigns in Persia and Ezra leads the second group of the Jews home. And he institutes a, a number of reforms that we're going to read about and learn about in Ezra chapters 7 through 10. Um, and then finally, in the future, after the book of Ezra, we got the book of Nehemiah. So in 444 BC, uh, Nehemiah leads the third group home and rebuilt the walls around Jerusalem. So Nehemiah, uh, we're also going to get to uh, shortly after we finish up the book of Ezra. Um, that'll be something that the, the men's Bible study continues on teaching. Uh, but the building of the walls was Nehemiah's chapters 1 through 6. So just on a, a kind of a rough timeline to put all of these dates in succession. Uh, I maybe could have put this one up while I was talking about some of the dates, but it, you can see how it starts at 586 all the way to the left. Uh, Cyrus becomes king, 538, temple construction begins. Dates are off maybe just one or two years in certain places, depending on what uh, scripture or, or what, not scripture, but what reference you might be looking at. Um, and then King Darius, I'll mention a little bit later, um, becomes king of Persia. We've got a couple prophets thrown in there on when their ministry is taking place. Uh, temple constructed in 515. Artaxerxes starts, becomes king in 464, minus seven years that we're going to talk about when we get to verse, um, I believe, eight and nine of Ezra, Ezra chapter seven. The seventh year of King Artaxerxes is when Ezra comes to Jerusalem. So that's the 458 BC that we just mentioned. And then again, Nehemiah. Uh, comes to Jerusalem to build the walls in 444 B.C. The first half of the book of Ezra, chapters 1 through 6, that we've already covered, takes place about 60 years before Ezra returns to Judah. And now we're going to first see Ezra here in uh, chapter 7 of this book. Half of the book of Ezra consists of uh, official documents and lists uh, so it's uh, perfectly appropriate that Ezra, being a scribe, he had access to a lot of these materials, so that way he was able to put together all the different things that happened 60 years in advance of him actually coming to Judah. And the uh, most royal correspondence that we see in part of this book is, uh, was probably written in Aramaic, uh, which is the international language of the Persian world at the time, uh, and then there's other narrative sections in this book that were written in Hebrew. So again, there was uh, two different languages in this book. Uh, another graphic. Also, I was curious when we were talking about uh, two of the prophets talked about in chapter 6 of Ezra. I was talking to Mike, I think, and I said I wanted to find a, a timeline of where do all the different prophets fall into place as far as like you know, when Jerusalem was destroyed and then the temple was rebuilt and all, we go back and forth with all the different minor prophets. And if you look at the um, minor prophets, that's the kind of the lime green color uh, that you see there. And then the, some of the major prophets uh, you see in the more purplish or dark blue colors. And you can see how they overlap. Um, so you don't really get the feel that they're, some of them are actually ministering doing their ministry at the same time just at different places in the in the country or world uh, like in this one place right here we got Habakkuk, Ob Obadiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel are almost ministering prophesying at the same time in different places if you just draw a line straight up through there you can see they kind of overlap all in that one couple of years for instance uh, but we got Haggai and Zechariah that are certainly ministering at the same time uh, around the time that the, the temple is being rebuilt, um, and that's when they were get running into that uh, hassles and stuff um, that we read about in Ezra chapters 5 and 6 from the people surrounding, and that's, uh, so that's when Haggai and um, Zechariah were ministering there. So, first life lesson to kind of bring this together, the God of Israel is faithful to his promises. He will completely restore his people 
when they come back to him. So we have an ingathering of the people that were exiled to Babylon for 70 years. Uh, they start coming back in three different waves. Uh, Zerubbabel brought back a big group of people. Ezra brought back a much smaller group of people. And then Nehemiah is going to bring back another group of people. So those are the three different stages or waves of people coming back to Jerusalem from Babylon, all permis given permission by the Persians. Um, it's kind of interesting that they were exiled in three different stages and they return in three different stages. So now, getting into chapter 1 and 2, or chapter 7, verse 1 and 2 of Ezra. Now after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub. So here is the first mention, finally, of the Ezra, the namesake of this whole book. And we have not heard from him at all through chapters 1 through 6 in this whole book. So the events of chapter 6, they take place during the reign of King Darius. We saw his name on that one of those timelines. He ruled from 521 B.C. to 486 B.C. And remember, the second temple was dedicated in 515 B.C., so, if you kind of are good with math so far, you may have heard me put together a few different numbers, um, but the chapter 7 jumps ahead, or it follows chapter 6, by 57 years. So, it's not evident, you know, when it says, now after these things, the words are right there, it, it's not real clear, what, what are we talking, a few weeks, a few months, a few years, yeah, five decades, almost six decades of time has elapsed in just those now after these things. So it's pretty interesting, if, and we'll see some uh, math that will bear out exactly those dates. Uh, so King Artaxerxes, we know from Scripture that his reign started in 464 B.C., and he finished up in 424 B.C. So 464 B.C. is the, the key number there. And Ezra returns in 458 B.C., um, so that's 515 B.C. is when the temple was dedicated, that was at the end of chapter 6, to 458, that's 57 years. So that's the time lapse that we're talking about here. And also notice, between King Darius and King Artaxerxes, there was another Persian king. Uh, who can remember who that king might be? So we have King Artaxerxes, and his brother was King Xerxes, or by, by another name, uh, King Ahasuerus. Uh, that should also be a familiar name to a lot of people. Uh, this King Xerxes was a ruler during the events of the book of Esther. Uh, this King Xerxes and Esther were married. So we'll see a little graphic here of roughly the, the little purple dot there kind of shows where Esther's story is taking place. Um, shifted left or shifted right just one or two years or so roughly, depending on what study Bible or what commentary you might be looking at, it, uh, where it may fall in the timeline. Uh, but you can see uh, much later as Ezra's reforms, um, down around 458 is where it starts, uh, and so on. Back there at 516 is where Zechariah and Haggai are prophesying that we read about way back in Ezra chapter 6. Moving on to verses 3 through 5. The son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Meroth, the son of Zariah, the son of Uzi, the son of Buki, the son of Abishua, the son of Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. Note through these three verses that many, many names are mentioned. God does not miss calling out a calling out by name those parts of Ezra's lineage. Uh, basically, he's, I think God is telling us that, you know, these names are important. Anytime you go through um, the book and there's these genealogies, as Pastor David continually points out when we come across one in Scripture, there's always something good, some sort of nugget buried in every single one of these genealogies. Um, and so here we have a list of names and this tells me, you know, that, that our names are important uh, for at least those of us that are believers, followers of Jesus Christ. Our names are going to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
our names are important. Um, so that's just kind of a key thing to think of. Fumbling with the paper here instead. So verse 6. This Ezra came up from Babylon, and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king granted him all his request according to the hand of the Lord, his God, upon him. So this Ezra, it starts off this verse saying, uh, this guy can track his lineage all the way back to Aaron, the chief priest, the high priest. So Ezra must have made some sort of request to King Artaxerxes uh, to return to Jerusalem because this verse says that the king granted him all his requests. So this may have been kind of at the threat of his own life. And so why do, why do I say that? What do I mean by that? Well, if you re remember back in the book of Esther, uh, Esther was uh, contemplating at one point in time, which she ended up doing, and she asked her maidens and other people to fast with her for three days while she decided whether or not she was actually going to approach King Xerxes. Uh, and at that time, if you went into his area, uh, in his court, and you wanted to make yourself known or ask a question of the king, and if you went in there and he did not extend his golden scepter toward you, that was punishable by death. So that's what, even though she was queen, Queen Esther was still at risk of not having the golden scepter extended towards her, so she took great risk at, at doing what she did. Uh, but it was ordained, essentially, you know, for such a time as this, as the book mentions, uh, she did what she did, and she was able to uh, grab a hold of his heart, grab his ear, uh, and eventually, you know, as the book goes, um, all the Jews were saved because of what she did. So, being that this wasn't all that long ago, this custom may still have been in, in place here with King Artaxerxes, so we still have the uh, possibility that when Ezra made this request of King Artaxerxes that maybe... He didn't know what King Artaxerxes was going to say, and that could have been life-threatening to him at the time. Um, so that's, I guess, speculation on my part, but it's something to ponder and think about that um, he made a request, he had to make a request, and the request was granted. Um, so it could have gone uh, bad the other way if, it, if the request wasn't granted. So the, also in this verse it says, according to the hand of the Lord, his God, upon him. In this chapter alone, we're going to see three different references of this phrase, according to the hand of the Lord. Uh, this phrase depicts God's grace working on Ezra's behalf. So every time we see this phrase, it's something almost miraculous has just happened. So him getting a request granted, that was Ezra saying, wow, that was miraculous almost, that God granted my request. So he worked or he touched King Artaxerxes' heart to allow this to happen. We'll see a second opportunity, or second, uh, according to the hand of the Lord, coming up soon. Verse 7, Some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. So the king Artaxerxes started his reign in 464 B.C. So 464 minus 7 is the 458 B.C. that uh, now I've mentioned a few times, but that's seven years after King Artaxerxes began his reign. Um, so 515 to 458, that's the 57 years after chapter 6 had uh, completed. But we see a whole team of people uh, coming back with Ezra. Uh, priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, and Nethanim. Um, I didn't remember at the time um, when I was putting my notes together what the Nethanim were, so I, I looked it up. Uh, so who were the Nethanim? This name means the given ones or those set apart. Uh, the Nethanim were a group of servants tasked with assisting the Levites in service of the temple. The Nethanim did the menial work required in temple operations, such as wood cutting and water carrying, essentially. So those were the, the Nethanim, uh, part of the Levites. Yes, that'd be another 
they were deacons, especially required for the, the physical aspects of maintaining uh, the church in that time, for, for lack of a better term. So Ezra knew he would not be able to accomplish what uh, was needed to be done by himself. He had all these different people coming back with him. He needed a team of people. Uh, we need to be team players in our present life. Um, as husbands, we need to pair up with our wives, especially when we have uh, more than one child. Or when we have kids, one kid is, is fairly, I mean, it takes a while to get accustomed to that as new parents. But then as you have more than one kid, okay, now you got one-on-one -on -one coverage. But then as you start to get three kids or four kids, now they can start to gang up on you and do double coverage on you. And Joel probably knows all about this. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, so we, as husbands, we need to pair up with our wives in many different situations in our child-rearing uh, practices. Uh, as workers in our occupations, we also need to um, be team players, and we need to pair up with our co-workers and work to accomplish in order to do great things at work. Sometimes there's the big projects that we're involved in at, at work, and uh, we maybe put on to a, a team of two, three, four, or more people um, so that requires uh, team playing. Also, uh, being a servant here at church. Uh, usually we're on a team. There aren't too many ministries that are uh, done by just one individual. Uh, even the, the teaching pastors, there's multiple teaching pastors. The worship team, the cafe team. I mean, they're, they're all teams, the sparkle team. They're made up of multiple people. Uh, the workday team. Uh, and it's real helpful, you know, when we have multiple people show up on a work day pooling the resources together as a team to get more things done. So as the saying goes, you know, many hands makes light work. Uh, so we do need to be uh, team players in many aspect, aspects of our life. So the life lesson, team players work and serve others for the glory of God. And that's what these people coming back with Ezra were really trying to focus on. Uh, they were team players, and they knew they had a mission that they were coming out to try and complete. They weren't worried about uh, reconstruction of the temple, because remember, the cons construction of the temple had been done many years before. So Ezra has a mission to come back and do some reconstructing on the people, not the temple. Verse 8, And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. So again, 464 minus 7, 456 B.C. is when he's making his trek back. They left roughly in the March-April time frame, um, and they arrived roughly in July-August time frame. I'm just getting that from a commentary. So they kind of left in the early spring and got there mid uh, to late summer. Uh, verse 9 tells us uh, how long it took. On the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon and on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the God, good hand of his God upon him. So this is the second reference of that. But notice it took exactly four months to journey from Babylon to Jerusalem. Roughly 900 miles was the distance they traveled in, in four months. Um, as I was listening to um, Pastor Joe Foch, I think, teach on this chapter, uh, he was giving a little bit of historical background to what was going on, and apparently there was some uh, civil turmoil going on, mostly uh, in Egypt, and that may have been partly why King Artaxerxes decided to grant Ezra's request, because they were trying to uh, appease uh, a lot of people in the area so there wouldn't be as much uprising as apparently that was going on. I didn't dig too deep into that, but he stated it as a um, secular history fact that there was a lot of turmoil uh, around this 460, 450 B.C. time frame. Um, so he, uh, the Persian kings were letting more and more people return to their homeland in kind of a, an appeasement uh, type situation. But also because of the civil turmoil, there's a lot of uh, raiders and bandits and things like that on the roads uh, between Babylon and this 900-mile trip back to Jerusalem. So it wasn't necessarily an easy trip to take, so again, he says, according to the good hand of his God upon him, he thought it was almost miraculous. It was at God's saving that allowed him to get from Babylon to Jerusalem safely in four months. Again, 900 miles. Uh, I didn't do the math to see what roughly that would have looked like as far as how many miles a day they had to travel, uh, but it was uh, quite, quite a few miles a day. 
And so this is kind of the, the map or the route, the, the pinkish or brownish bottom line is 457 Ezra making his trip back. Uh, again, through other accounts, I've been using the f term or the year 458 uh, BC. But you can see how they kind of followed the river as far as they could, and then they kind of came down to Tadmor, Damascus, and then down uh, into Jerusalem. And then uh, Nehemiah, he's coming from Susa, and then he kind of follows the same route that Ezra probably did. Verse 10, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. So Ezra prepared his heart. Basically, another way of saying that is he um, was disciplining his heart. And it says here that he was to seek the law, to do it, and to teach it. So this is kind of a, just a, a few little phrases here of things that we could probably practice and implement in our life, especially when it comes to seeking the word or seeking knowledge, almost any, trying to learn anything. You need to seek knowledge about it. You need to then do it and then teach it. But this is what Ezra's mindset was because he knew he had a mission in front of him to do some reconstruction on the people that were there. So seeking the law of the Lord. Basically, uh, I took this to be like he was really inquiring into or of the word. Remember, he's a scribe, so he's got access to uh, all of the literature and documentation that he needs to learn. And a couple passages of scripture that remind me of, you know, seeking the law or seeking the, yeah, the law of the Lord or inquiring into the word was um, an SOD verse, actually, 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then also in Psalm 1 verse 2, but his delight in the law is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. So those are in reference to seeking the law of the Lord. And then we're to do the law of the Lord. Not just know the law, but obey it, and then to do it. And then finally, to teach the law of the Lord. So being a Levite, Ezra was charged with the responsibility of instructing the Israelites and modeling also loyalty. So that was one of his key things. He wanted to get back with the people and model loyalty, model character, model integrity, and bring this back into the fold of all the different Israelites that came back with him and those that were already there. So think about this, though. Ezra had never been to Jerusalem, yet he was a very skilled scribe. Uh, so he must have had been taught by his elders, maybe some people that were brought from uh, Jerusalem to Babylon in the initial uh, deportation, or in that third deportation of people, because um, that was, what, 50-ish years ago? Um, so 586 B.C. was the last deportation, and we're talking now at, um, well, I was just trying to do the math in my head. That was a little off, because now it's 458 B.C. It's still 60-ish years. So there's still some people that were alive. We know that because they, you know, they were weeping and moaning about when they saw the foundations of the second temple being built. They had reflected or remembered what the first temple looked like. Um, so we knew there was still people there in Babylon alive that could have been teaching uh, and mentoring Ezra as he was learning to be the best scribe that he could be. And we're going to learn or see here in a couple of uh, passages of Scripture how esteemed Ezra is. Here in this next verse, it says, This is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave Ezra, the priest, the scribe, expert in the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. So the words, the priest, the scribe, expert in the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes, describe Ezra with exceptional praise. So the king did know something about Ezra, and he knew of his knowledge, I guess, uh, through word of mouth or however. Um, he, he knew of Ezra, and he, he had high praise of Ezra. 
is what we're seeing here in Scripture. In verse 12, Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of God of heaven, perfect peace, and so forth. When I first read this, I kind of, I, a little, I chuckled a little bit because when he says perfect peace and so forth, it's kind of like, eh, we're going to let you go back, go, go do your thing type thing and so forth. I'm not sure kind of what that and so forth, how that would have been translated in the original language if it was, it was tongue in cheek. Okay. Okay. But I just wonder if there was a different um, undertone when, when, is what the king might have meant when he was sharing this with Ezra or writing this letter. And also it says, you know, King Artaxerxes, king of kings. I also thought when I was read that again, uh, I, I said out loud, not. He's not the king of kings. We know who the king of kings is. Yeah, and, and I even put that in my notes. These are little K's uh, in Scripture, not, not capital K's, like Jesus the king. Exactly. However, the uh, Persian kings were literally kings over um, many other kings because uh, the Persian Empire included many conquered kingdoms. So that's kind of what he was alluding to when he was saying king of kings, even though we uh, probably interpret that a little bit different. Uh, but yeah, like Kevin said, they're all little K's, uh, not the capital K king that we're thinking of. And then verse 13, I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. So the king here, we see for the first time of him being very generous. Uh, note, volunteers were allowed to go, which means you did not have to go. So I can imagine there were probably many people in Babylon that after being there for so many years uh, were probably pretty set where they were at. They may have, because they weren't in a isolation, concentration camp type setting. They were allowed to build houses and enter into the marketplace and build their families, grow their families. Um, they were allowed to do all that. So it wasn't like they, they just weren't allowed to go back home. But otherwise, they were able to do everything that they were sort of able to do back in Jerusalem, but just not in Jerusalem. So they had probably set up their businesses and their families and their lifestyle and got pretty accustomed to doing what they were doing there in Babylon. So that's why we see a kind of a small group of people going back with Ezra comparatively to the big group of people that went back with Zerubbabel. The people, also it says the, the people of Israel not just, you know, the people of Judah. So I just kind of drew a, a little distinction there. You know, the people from all 12 tribes were allowed to go back to Jerusalem. Just everybody that wanted to go were able to go. And, it, and God kind of, by the indication of the Holy Spirit, said people of Israel, not just the people of Judah or the people from the Jerusalem area. It was people of Israel. So I, I'm thinking, you know, that's probably some people from every tribe were ma finally making their way back because people from every tribe were deported uh, from Jerusalem, from Judea, from the northern kingdom and southern kingdom uh, to Babylon during the course of these three different stages of deportation. So now we're uh, bringing all those, all those people back. Verse 14, And whereas you are being sent by the king and his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem, with regard to the law of your God, which is in your hand. So, kind of a wow here. Um, seven counselors got to travel with Ezra, we see here in the scripture. And here also we see uh, the words, your God, are being used here at the end of that passage by the king. So this heathen king was respecting the God of Ezra. Uh, I have to imagine with all these uh, people in the area that were deported from Babylon that were Jews and they were continually to living, uh, worshiping their one true God, capital G, God, amongst all these Babylonians, uh, that for so many years that word got out of the, the respect that they probably had gained from some of the Babylonians and the king knew of this and he was you know, uh, 
with regard to the law of your God, he was kind of giving them praise and honor and respecting the God of Ezra. Verse 15, And whereas you are to carry the silver and gold, which the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. So King Artaxerxes, uh, being a polytheist, you know, probably believing in many different small, small g gods, uh, may have thought that the Jewish God actually lived in a temple in Jerusalem. Uh, he may have thought that. I don't, I don't know. Um, so it, it's, again, interesting that he once again uh, talks about the, the God of Israel, the God of Ezra. Um, but I also thought when I read this, when it says, um, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem, I again read that and said out loud, not. I mean, that's not where God lives. You know, we, d we just know that to kind of be his, his footstool. I think it mentions that in some other um, s scripture. Uh, but we know that God is everywhere at, at all time. It, you know, whenever we pray to God, it's, he's there. Um, you, you get the idea of a, how we feel about God, and it's just not the God of Jerusalem. God uses unbelievers to accomplish his work. So he's using King Artaxerxes. He's used King Xerxes. He's used King Darius. He uses unbelievers to accomplish his work. And we probably can see that and think of other people in our life uh, where we know uh, an unbeliever is somehow spoken into our life. So a life lesson here would be God may work in mysterious ways in your eyes, but he does have a plan and what he desires to accomplish will happen. So even though we may not understand his ways, um, his plan will happen. It will come to fruition. And verse 16, And whereas all the silver and gold that you may find in all the province of Babylon, along with the free will offering of the people and the priests, are to be freely offered for the house of their God in Jerusalem. I forgot to mention back in verse 15 here uh, that the first source of offering uh, is the silver and gold from the king and his counselors. And then here in verse 16, a second source of offering is the silver and gold of the people of Babylon. And then also here in the same verse, it says the third source of offerings are the free will offering of the Jewish people who remained in Babylon. So these are the Jewish people that decided not to come back to Jerusalem. They also put up an offering for Ezra to take back. And I see this word freely a couple times in this passage. So that I, I wanted to just bring up a, a verse that may come to mind, but in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 3, we are told of a story of some Macedonians that really gave freely, uh, and they were almost had to be held back or stopped from giving beyond what they were able. But it says here, starting in verse 1 of chapter 8, uh, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. So note that God accepts the gifts of those who do not know him. Remember, it was from the king and his counselors made one gift or offering, and then it was from the people of Babylon. Again, not Jewish people, just the other Babylonian people made an offering, and then the Jews in Babylon gave the third offering. So God accepts the gifts of those who do not know him as well as the gifts of those who know and serve him. So he's not really only accepting gifts from children of God. He's accepting gifts from whoever wants to worship him. And the only gifts God rejects are those given by people who appear to know him but whose hearts are far from him. So those really aren't given with a freely giving heart. Uh, we should never be giving things um, out of compunction. That's, is that the right word? Compulsion. <laughs> compunction didn't sound quite right. Uh, compulsion. We shouldn't be forced into giving anything. Um, we need to be doing it of a free, willing heart. 
no matter what the amount, and that's what God really uh, appreciates is that free will offering. And then finally in verse 17, Now therefore be careful to buy with this money bulls, rams, and lambs with their grain offerings and their drink offerings and offer them on the altar of the house of your God in Jerusalem. So the king clearly states that the God of Jerusalem is not his God because he uses the word, words again, your God. This is the second time where he's speaking in this letter to Ezra and he says, your God, your God, not my God, but your God. Um, so we understand that and that's, that's fine. Uh, and then also the, the gold and the silver that are mentioned here, they were things that were, they were supposed to be used to buy things of worship. Uh, you know, the bulls, the rams, the lambs, and the grain offering and the drink offering, all those things were for, to, to provide for the worship there at the temple. Because remember, they didn't need any of this gold and silver and money and offerings for the construction of the temple anymore. Why? Because remember we talked about the temple had been constructed for nearly 60 years at this point. Uh, so there was maybe maintenance that needed to be done on the temple, but most of the gold and silver and the offerings that were being offered up were for the worship that was to take place in the temple. Uh, 